Um, all right, well, thank you for coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, IPv6, and um, I guess unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably uh, heard about it in the news, even in mainstream news, um, because officially at the top level we've run out of IPv4 addresses, which is what practically everyone's been using uh, until now, and um, that's mainly because the original IPv4 address space was 32 bits, which is only 4 billion or whatever odd addresses, and the population of the planet is more than that. <laughs> um, and I think uh, June 8 or something has been declared World IPv6 Day, so <laughs> I don't know what that means in practice. But, <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to talk about the sort of network engineering issues related to this. Um, someone actually said to me the other day what they thought the talk was about, and I think it really sums it up. It is for you to know what to say when your boss comes to your desk and says, I've heard about this IPv6 thing, what are we doing about it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I sort of want to go into a little analogy for a moment. When I, I don't travel very much, but when I travel to North America or to Europe, I'm actually in fear of my life. And that's because you all drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and what, apparently, I think it was Sweden a few years ago, also used to drive the same as Australia on the left-hand side of the road. And uh, to be consistent with the rest of Europe, they decided they needed to switch. And so they declared this day where the day before everyone's driving on the left, and the next day everybody's driving on the right. I'm going to tell you right now, this is not going to happen with IPv6. <laughs> there is not going to be a little change over where all the IPv4 gets turned off. In fact, I think even the equipment that I'm running at home right now for my broadband connection is not IPv6 capable. So, okay, so what, what do we have to do about it? So, Today I'm going to give you a really brief cheat sheet, the basic things that you just need to know to get programs working with IPv6, the basic uh, concepts and things. And then I'm going to talk about how uh, ASIO is designed to support IPv6, so just the API classes uh, for that support. And then I'm going to talk about how to write client-side programs and then how to write server-side programs. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to compare against IPv4, since I'm assuming most of you are familiar with um, IPv4 in some way. So first of all, the difference is IPv4, we have uh, 32 bits for each address, and IPv6 is 128 bits. And I don't know what 2 to the 128 is, but it's, it's big. <laughs> the next thing is... Okay, we all we all know and love the uh, the dotted decimal address. Hey, that's my router. <laughs> <laughs> I hacked it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. Um, and okay, I guess yes. You 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 know it's your router. You can remember it. Can uh, you yes. maybe enlarge the picture a bit? Uh, I don't know. Can we? Um, it may have a, a zoom on on the projector. And yeah, as, uh, as you can remember your own router address, I think there's only four numbers in there, that's not too hard to remember. Uh, the IPv6 addresses are written out in hex format. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Yes, what there are uh, these eight two-byte pairs making up the, the address and uh, yeah, just written out in, in hexadecimal. Now, you are actually allowed to compress one run of zeros in uh, an IPv6 address by just dropping it out and leaving the columns there and I think they're trying to make them at least, you know, within a local network you can maybe remember it if you like. Uh, the, there is a standard representation for an endpoint, an endpoint being, in ASIO terms, it's an IPv address and a port number. 
Um, the old style IPv4 is a distress colon port, but because colons are actually used inside the IPv6 address, they, I think this actually came from HTTP um, originally, mm -hmm. so the address portion is enclosed in square brackets. Uh, yep. Port still 16 bits? Yes, port okay. still 16 bits, yes. Why didn't they use a dot? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, for which one? Between the X, yeah. the, yeah. 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 Well, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I could guess maybe so you can tell which one you're supposed to be parsing. You, as soon as you reach a calling line, this is not IPv4. This is not your father's IP address. <laughs> well, at least, at least they made one improvement, and that's the loopback address, which for IPv4, the 127001, is now just colon colon one. And that's because that thing I said where you get to drop um, a string of zeros, that's actually zero, 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 seven zeros, and then a one. And there's the counterpart for the any address, which if you're writing a server, you're probably familiar with because it means you're listening on all of the interfaces in your host. And that for IPv4 is the all zeros. It's also all zeros. Um, for IPv6, but again, is compressed. And on some platforms, you may actually see it represented as zero, colon, colon, zero. I just assume that's an implementation detail. Okay, that, that, I mean, that's really in a nutshell there. Um, there's, there are more complicated things, but you know, there's Wikipedia, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so in ASIO, there's a few classes that together give you the IPv6 support. And there's a few underlying design principles here. And one is that most user code should not need to be aware of whether it's operating on IPv4 or on IPv6. But because that necessarily entails an implementation dealing in alternately IPv4 or IPv6 addresses, I also did not want to impose any costs associated with new and delete. So what I've done is I um, take a variant approach. I mean, it's a very simple variant. It's just either IPv4 address or IPv6 address. OK, so the classes that make up uh, the API are arranged like they have this relationship. So usually when you're starting up some sort of program, a client program, you need to resolve some addresses from a domain name server, DNS, and that's what the resolver is for. And so the resolver in ASIO returns you a list of endpoints. Um, it actually mirrors the POSIX get address info function, if you're familiar with that. So rather than just giving you a list of addresses, you pass in a host name and a service name or port number, and you get back a list of corresponding um, endpoints. And an endpoint is composed of three things. One is the protocol, and that's and by that I mean IPv4 or IPv6, the address, and the 16-bit port number. Now, the protocol class is, in ASIO, it is, first of all, as a concept for a protocol, there's, well, actually, there's two concepts. There's protocol and internet protocol, and it's actually internet protocol that um, is relevant here. And there's two, um, two classes that implement the internet protocol concept, and those are the TCP and UDP mm -hmm. classes. And they are value type objects that you can assign into, uh, but you can only assign either it only really has two possible values, and one is the value that represents IPv4 and the other that represents IPv6. But you can see, once you've actually made that assignment, you can then use it when you create a socket, say, and at this point you're not aware, of, you don't need to be aware anyway, of which uh, variant that you're using. Uh, so this is just an alternative syntax for initial load seeing the socket if you're not able to open it uh, at its point of construction. You can also, if you do need to write some protocol 
specific code, you can compare uh, protocol values to test for B4 or B6. The next component that makes up the endpoint, the address, uh, most of the time you will be dealing in the protocol independent version, which is just ASIO IP address. And actually internally it contains um, one of the, each of the other types, address V4 and address V6. If you're dealing with an address in protocol independent form, normally what you're going to be doing is converting it from maybe a configuration file or a command line argument. So you're going to have it in string form. And so to do that, you can just call the from string function and it will automatically de determine whether or not it's a v4 or a v6 address and uh, construct the address appropriately. Then, I mean, if you want to do the opposite conversion, to string just converts into the dotted decimal or hex format. There are also some sort of uh, pseudo constants for the well known uh, addresses like loopback and the any address. So if you do need to, in one part of the code, say I am explicitly specifying the IPv4 loopback, then that's the sort of approach you would take. But then once you've assigned it into the address objects, you no longer need to know which version it is. I've also, uh, on user request for Boost 147, there are some new functions uh, added to the address class because the concepts of loopback and unspecified and synonym for any and uh, multicast addresses apply equally to IPv4 and IPv6, so I've added these uh, functions that you can use to test if you need certain behavior based on um, whether it's one of those types of addresses. If you do need to deal in the specific uh, address types, then what you can do is given a uh, address v4, you can just assign it into the, the generic address class. Alternatively, you can test and then extract the protocol-specific address from, from the generic type. And obviously, same thing for version 6. OK, now, if you do want to deal specifically in IPv6 addresses, then the from string will only accept uh, the hex format address. And it's possible, I don't know, if you're writing a configuration file, although you may want to, in your program as a whole, deal in the generic address type, uh, you want to require an IPv6 address in a certain place or something. In which case, if you use this from string conversion, then it will give you an error if it's not the correct uh, format for that type. You can also, because there are times, if, particularly if you're receiving addresses out of some protocol coming off the wire, that you need to construct these addresses from the raw representation, which for IPv4 is the big Indian 32-bit. Uh, and so for that, you can uh, construct it from an array of unsigned char. And so for the IPv6 address, that's a 16-element uh, array. There's a four-element array equivalent for the... Uh, B4 address. And if you need to do the opposite conversion, uh, it's, there's two bytes as well. And although I've never seen a use of this in practice, there is a facility for um, creating these things called B4 mapped addresses, and there's another one I've seen a moment called B4 compatible addresses, and these are ways of representing uh, IPv4 addresses in an IPv6 format and so these classes give you a way to both test whether or not uh, it is that class of address and then make the conversion uh, in either direction. And yes, so there's the, uh, the V4 compatible equivalent. Okay, so 
we had those three components, the protocol, the address, and the port number. That's put together, as we saw, in the endpoint type. And there are separate endpoints for TCP and UDP. Um, you can see the classes there. And uh, when you use them, you gen generally use them in a completely protocol independent way. They, they're actually implemented using this template. So there's type diffs for this type. And this is done so that um, if you do need to, there are, I mean, there are additional um, internet protocols out there like ICMP, which ASIO does support natively, um, SCTP, I'm sure there are some others. If you do need to extend it, then this is the starting point for that. Now, when, when there are several ways to construct an endpoint. If you want to specify um, a listening endpoint, so an endpoint that is listening on the any address, if you like, of your local system, then you can either do that to say explicitly, I'm creating one for, unit, uh, for IP version 4 or for IP version 6, as shown in the top two lines here. Uh, and they're both using the same port number there. Uh, alternatively, if you've already obtained your address, your protocol independent address object from somewhere, you can construct um, the endpoint in that way. And if you need to get the elements back out again, then there are the accessor functions that you can use. Okay, so particularly now that we're going to have to deal with these uh, massive hex addresses, um, you're going to be using DNS. Okay, so that, that's what the resolver is for. So you, you give it a host name and you give it a service name or a port number. And if you're not familiar with the idea of a service name, that means something like HTTP or SMTP, which on depends on the platform, how it's configured, but somewhere there's probably a file that has a mapping between these names and the corresponding port numbers. So when <coughs> you use a resolver, the first thing you need to do is construct a query for it. And so you supply the, the host name and service name as strings. And then uh, you resolve it, and the resolve gives you an iterator as the return value because, of course, domain name resolution can give you one or more, or zero or more, if it fails, um, responses for any given host name. And so the typical thing you'll then do is you'll uh, iterate over that sequence of endpoints in some way. And we'll, when I come to the, uh, the client, how to design the client programs, so we'll see why that's important. And if you have a very specific use case, you can limit your queries to only return endpoints for IP version 4 or IP version 6, if you need to. Okay, the other um, thing you'll probably run into if you're doing any serious uh, socket program is at some point you're going to be setting options on your sockets, like common ones for doing no delay and buffer sizes and whatever, but some of the standard socket options have identifiers that are specific to the IP protocol, the IP version. So they'll actually, if you're using the C socket API, you have to supply different flags uh, depending on which, uh, which protocol you're using. ASIO hides that away for you, so you only need to deal with the higher level conceptual socket option and it will automatically apply the correct one for you underneath. Uh, so the example I've got here is uh, there's a, well for IPv4 it's traditionally called TTL or time to live. Uh, for IPv6 it's called POPs. So I've adopted the, uh, the IPv6 name here. And so when you set that option, internally ACO will go, oh, this socket is an IPv4 socket, I need to set the IP TTL option, or alternatively set the unicast hops option on the socket if it's an IPv6. Okay, well that, that's a really quick tour of the uh, 
the API is going to provide us. Now I'm going to talk about how you should actually use it in practice if you want to be uh, IP version independent. So if you're writing a client, there are these three principles that you should keep in mind as a, as a general rule. So the first one is you want, you want to keep as much of your program as possible independent of the IP protocol. The next thing is that although you can deal in the address objects if you want to, you should probably prefer just to work in endpoints. And finally, that this is very important if you're a client, uh, when you do a resolve, you may get back a list of both IPv6 and IPv4 uh, endpoints, but you may not have um, IPv6 routing capability from your system. So it's important that you try um, every endpoint you get until you find one that works. And so, uh, yep. Are the endpoints sorted in the way that the IPv6 is first? So there's um, some RFC. Okay, yeah, so the question is, are the endpoints sorted so that v6 is first, and the answer to that is generally yes. I'm not sure if that's a standard or not, but that... Well, there's a recommendation. That it might just be a recommendation. Adopt v6 as the first. That's, that's right, and uh, I'll actually come back to that in a moment. Okay. Um, okay, so we saw this before when I had the resolver example. This is a TCP client, so um, we're using the TCP resolver to resolve an iterator representing the list of endpoints. Then what you need to do is write some logic a little bit like this. And so this is to attempt a connection to each of the endpoints. And here I'm, I'm just illustrating with the synchronous code, but the same principle applies if you're going to use the async connect function. So we start off at the beginning, and until we reach the end, and while we have an error code. Because as soon as we have a successful connect, we want to say, that's it, we don't want to keep, keep trying. So we just basically loop, uh, closing any previous attempt and starting uh, the next connection attempt in the loop. Now, uh, this year, because I've decided to uh, free myself up to actually make changes to the ASIO API, um, I've added a, a new helper function for this. Uh, ASIO Connect. Mm -hmm. So if you get to upgrade to Boost 147, then I'd actually recommend just doing it this way. Because it's going to be such a common pattern moving forward that it deserves to be uh, encapsulated. And so all this does uh, is takes the iterator returned by uh, the resolver and uh, keeps trying until one is successful. Uh, now there's a little cheat here because the resolver iterators, the end iterator is a default constructed iterator. Uh, it, this particular overload of connect just assumes that um, whatever iterator type it's passed represents the end. But there are other overloads that you can pass uh, a pair of iterators. Is that just the accepter connector pattern, the connector part of the accepter connector pattern? More or less, yeah. Uh, Okay, now this comes back to your question before. I mean, let's face it, even though we've run out of IPv4 addresses, probably for the foreseeable future, we're still going to be primarily using uh, IPv4. And if you have the IPv6 addresses first, and you always try them first, then you're going to be making these, um, these attempts to connect that are always going to fail, your connections are always going to take longer, and so on. I think that shouldn't take any time because the the local routing well, table should it, it see it. It depends. It depends where the the routing uh, stops. It might. It could be. You know, like. Well, I'm wondering whether anyone has really seen that. I I actually came across this idea on the PostgreSQL mailing list. Oh, okay. So, yes, I think out in the real okay. world people have. So you could do something like this where. You actually copy the list of endpoints first into a vector or something, and then, so I've used a stable partition here to put the IPv4 addresses first. Um, I d deliberately is stable because it could be that the DNS resolution deliberately returned the addresses in a particular order because um, some of them might be the preferred host for a particular host name. 
But after that, the, uh, the connection proceeds pretty much as before, except this time it's using the uh, vector iterator. And again, if you get to upgrade to boost 147, you can just use this, uh, this helper function to do it for you. Does resolve return an input iterator? Uh, I think it's just a forward. So it's not an input iterator, you can store one at any point. It's not uh -huh. destructive in that way. Oh, okay. So. okay, so if you're writing a UDP client, UDP is a bit trickier though because generally you are sending um, a datagram to a specific host or a group of hosts using a broadcast or multicast. So uh, you don't ha really have the equivalent of trying uh, each host until one works necessarily. So for that, you're more likely I'd say, I mean, you, to be converting from a, uh, an address as a string rather than a host name. So you, in this case, you can still use a resolver and specify numeric host. And if you specify that, then it prevents it from going off to the DNS server um, to resolve the host name. It saves a little bit of time. Um, and then once you've done that, you've, you've got the UDP endpoint that you can then use when you do a send to operation on any um, outbound datagrams. Alternatively, you could just go back to using the address class as I showed earlier, and use the from string to convert directly from the string representation. And that obviously will not do any hostname resolution at all. Um, what is appropriate for you really depends on the, the protocol that you're implementing, I guess. I think, in my experience, most of the UDP has involved configuration files with specific IP addresses um, being specified. Could you go back to the previous slide just so I can compare? So, yeah, here we've got the constructing a uh, resolver query okay. with the. So that, that's host name usually. Yeah. Okay, and on the other side, we've got uh, server programs. Uh, I, I know it's a little artificial, often programs are both clients and servers. But. So the principles. Here a little different though, because we've got to consider where the server is going to be deployed. So we've got basically we've got systems that have support for IPv4 and IPv6, and then we've got systems that are IPv4 only. Um, except that's not quite right. We've actually got systems that have IPv4 and IPv6 as dual stack, and that means that um, you can as an, you can construct an IPv6 uh, listener socket and acceptor, but then accept incoming connections from IPv4 clients directly. And then we have systems that are separate stacks, and what that means is that you can't mix and match the two. You have, if you want to accept connections from IPv4 clients, you have to be listening on an IPv4 address, and similarly, an IPv6 address to accept IPv6 clients. Now. Uh, most, I think most POSIX systems, I think POSIX actually mandates dual stack. Um, separate stacks, so prior to Windows Vista, I think, was all separate stacks, even when IPv6, so XP has IPv6 support, but it's a separate stack. And I think, I'm not sure about Vista, but definitely Windows 7 onwards has proper um, dual stack support. And of course, yeah, you've got older systems that are IPv4 only still. Uh, sorry, that's still not quite right. Uh, we now have the possibility of dual stack systems where the system administrator has turned off uh, dual stack support. So, for example, on Linux, there's a, a kernel configuration option to, to turn it off. Um, so, this is quite complex. How can we write servers that uh, can deal with all of these deployment conditions? Okay, so if you're running a TCP server, then you can make a choice based on this. You can either go with just having one acceptor, one listener, and in that case you can support dual stack 
you can support IPv6 only or you can support IPv4 only. Or if you are willing to take the extra complexity, you can run two separate, uh, up to, sorry, two acceptors and then be able to deploy your program to all types of environment. So the first one is probably the simplest and that's where you just have a single acceptor and you construct it probably from a string um, in a configuration file and actually most of the ASIO examples take this approach where the string comes in as a command line argument. So you can, you can run your program with the 0, 0, 0, 0, dotted decimal and it will automatically start listening for IPv4 and uh, or you can use the IPv6 any address and it will automatically start listening for IPv6. If, if the application you are running is one where you can actually run multiple instances of the program, uh, so there's no shared state, so this is probably the, the best approach because it's the simplest approach. There's a variance on this where you actually run multiple single acceptors uh, where you, in a configuration file, you have a list of all the addresses you want the server to listen on and you then construct, dynamically create um, as many acceptors as there are uh, addresses in that list. And I've, I've used that myself. Um, because that also gives you the flexibility of listening on a specific uh, interface rather than um, all the, any address. Okay, so the next thing, if you... Uh, You want to support um, dual stack systems, but you need to know whether you are actually support. You do have proper dual stack support. Then what you can do is, after determining the endpoint that you're going to listen on, you can try to set this socket option here called V6 only to false. Uh, on POSIX systems, it specified that it should default to false. But on, say, older Windows systems, it actually defaults to true because it's not possible for it to, uh, to be false because it's a separate stack system. So that means that if you make this call, that the fact that it fails tells your program that you are uh, not on a dual stack system. So this is a way of testing at runtime uh, what, what support you have. And then after that, yeah, you just continue as before. But we can use the same sort of uh, technique. We'll see. Uh, sorry, the same socket option in the in the two acceptors case. If you want to uh, support all um, scenarios, so the the first option here is um, <coughs> to create your acceptors so that you will have one for IPv4 and one for IPv6, and the IPv6 one will disable the dual stack support. And so that all you need to do here is when you construct construct two of the acceptors and then set that v6 only option to true and then from then on no IPv4 clients will be handled uh, through that acceptor. If you don't want to open two acceptors unless you have to because I mean underneath there's a file descriptor right? perhaps you're in an environment where you're sensitive to resources being used then you might write something like this where instead of setting the v6 only option, we're, we're getting the value v6 only. So we first create an acceptor for IP version 6, and then we get the value of v6 only. It fills it out in uh, this variable up here. And then after that, we can test whether or not it's been set to true or false to decide whether, we, whether or not we also need to um, also need to create the second acceptor for IPv4 connections. And there's an option three, and I forgot about option three. Uh, okay, so what did I actually need here? <laughs> right, uh, so in this case what we're trying to do is set, after opening the, the IPv6 acceptor, we're trying to say that it's not um, v6 only and then 
we get the value to determine uh, whether or not we were successful in making that um, that call. We, um, you could also be testing the error code here, but I'm deliberately ignoring the error code so that I can just continue because um, <coughs> we're not actually handling it as an error case so much as uh, we're just proceeding through normal logic flow. So we, we retrieve the basics only option, and then if if true. Uh, we need to create the second acceptor to listen for the IPv4 connections. So this code is probably the most flexible of all the options and if you really do want to both minimize your resource usage and support all deployment options then um, this is probably the way to go. But it, it's quite complex so you know, I, I would, unless you have a real need to do that uh, I would probably go for one of the earlier, simpler options. Uh, now, UDP servers are actually fairly similar on the server side, so I'll, I'll just skip through it quickly. And here, again, we can create the socket so it's bound to an address specified in, uh, as a string. And again, we can um, determine whether or not we're on a dual stack system by uh, making this set option call um, to try and disable basics only. And we have the same types of options as we did in the TCP case. So we can create two separate sockets for UDP um, B4 and B6. And in this case we're always setting the V61 to true, so we're going to always use two separate sockets. Actually, just out of interest, does anybody have a need for UDP of both IPv4 and IPv6? Anybody come across that? Because every, every use I've had on UDP has always been uh, like just one, typically IPv4. So, um, And... We, if we want to minimize resource usage again, then we can use the V6 only option to test whether or not um, the dual stack support is available and we need to run the second socket. And option three, almost identical to the TCP case. Okay, um, and so that's, that's basically it. So there's just, I suppose there's just the three rules of thumb that I, I'd want you to take away from that, and that's First of all, that try to keep your code protocol independent as much as you can. I realize it's not um, always possible and sort of as an admission, there are parts of ASIO where it's not possible, um, particularly if you're going to deal in multicast and that's because I think I, I haven't sufficiently analyzed the problem space to be able to write um, a proper API for it. Uh, remember if you're writing a client, do try all your endpoints. Uh, I've often seen people comment on mailing lists or whatever that, oh, yeah, you, you only need to do the first, the first uh, address that you get back. That's not true. Okay? If you don't go and do an NS lookup for something like google.com, you are definitely going to get back uh, multiple addresses in the response. And finally, if you're writing a server, um, always consider the deployment environment. So if you know you're only going to deploy to um, single stack systems or dual stack systems or whatever, like if you have control over the, the system configuration, then take the easy way out. <laughs> um, and that's it. Does this also handle zero conf situations where you don't look do DNS look up or say in the Apple world, bonjour? I sort of believe things like that are implemented on top of multicast. Yeah. Uh, you probably, right. see, what you need to do is very similar to the UDP server approach, right? You'd be um, possibly opening up to two sockets depending on whether or not uh, you have the two interfaces mm -hmm. in your system and then, and then you'd need to send out your multicast announcements on on both sockets possibly. Can you do multicast with, with uh, ASIO? Yes, you can, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the limitations of multicast and ASIO come from uh, are actually mostly in the socket options. If you need to do things like um, subscribe 
to a multicast group on a specific interface. Unfortunately, uh, uh, IPv4 works in terms of address. Uh, IPv6 works in terms of um, interface index. So you actually subscribe on interface number two or something like that. So there's a there's a little bit of a disconnect there that I haven't yet found the appropriate um, abstraction for. Okay. Yep. I know that with privacy extensions, you occasionally get new addresses on your net interface. Does that affect servers in some way, or is just that okay. address so that you does, bound does to dynamic your socket kept alive? Right. So does dynamic address yeah. changes uh, affect this? Um, if I think if you are using the any addresses, then you should be fine. Oh, okay. Okay. If you if you end up using, say, the first approach and... So you shouldn't resolve your own address because then... Uh, you shouldn't resolve your own address. Well, there are actually sometimes good reasons for mm -hmm. listening on a specific interface rather than all interfaces. So, uh, yeah, it's not a blanket rule, I guess. Uh, it, it depends it depends on the sort of system you're deploying on. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.